Hello and welcome to episode 390 of Geek Town Radio. I'm your host Dave and I'm back this week with... How are you doing? I'm um, great. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. Uh, it's been a little while since you've been on because we were off for a month. So <laughs> um, lovely to have you back. What have you been watching? Well, it's great to be back. So let's start with Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Yes. Remember when we were worried that it would never get here? <laughs> but now we have more Star Trek that we can handle. <laughs> so Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which is weird to say, but it's set between Discovery and the original series. Because yes. that's weird. That's where it is on the timeline. Yes. Um, and it falls the USS Enterprise under Captain Christopher Pike and his amazing hair. <laughs> so it stars Alison Mount as Pike, Ethan Peck as Spock, Rebecca Romaine as Una Chin Riley, and Jess Bush as Nurse Christine Chapel. So you're people who you probably would recognize if you're, like me, a Star Trek fan. If you've seen the first season, you know it's very much in the original series sort of vein. It's very adventure heavy and just lots of fun. Yeah. Moving away from Discovery, which is incredibly serious and dour at times. <laughs> yes. To say the least. And it's available through Paramount Plus. This season takes things a big step further. We've got a musical episode coming up. Yes. And we've just had a crossover episode with, um, what's the name of it? I don't know you know this. Uh, Lower Decks. Lower Decks, Star Trek Lower Decks, which is the animated sort of Star Trek show. I can't recommend it highly enough. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. It's literally sort of the answer to everyone who endlessly complained about Discovery. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's very much the spiritual successor to the original series and is very episodic. There is some underlying sort of continuing plot stuff, but mm. very, very light. It's it's pretty much different situations each episode. It's very much in the same vein as the original series. The the last couple of episodes have been really interesting because th- those old scientists, which was the crossover episode with Lower Decks, very fun, very silly. It's one of, if not the highest rated Star Trek episode ever. I mean, there is a lot of love for that episode out there and uh, the live action version of those animated characters which came across really, really, really well. So I really, really love that episode directed by the legendary Jonathan Frakes, Riker and impressive beard wearer. And the next episode, which was out this week, which is Under the Cloak of War, it couldn't be more of a sort of 180 from the previous episode in that it's a much, much darker episode dealing with sort of PTSD and the events of the Klingon war when they get a a Klingon ambassador that comes to onto the Enterprise who is working on behalf of the Federation for Peace but there are obviously people on the Enterprise that fought in the Klingon war and it's sort of about what happened between them really I mean you couldn't have two more completely opposite episodes straight one after each other which is really really interesting and then the episode as you mentioned earlier that's coming up is Subspace Rhapsody which is the musical episode which I'm very interested in seeing how they pull that off, whether that actually works. It's just been superb, that series. It's so well put together. Yeah, I think you've uh, put it out quite well. Yeah, I don't think they've mentioned whether they've renewed it already yet. I can't remember whether they have... Uh... Oh, yeah, no, they did. They ordered a third series in March. So uh, okay. I, I can't say I'm surprised by that. I mean, no. we know Discovery is coming to an end, so it sort of makes sense that that was renewed. I think Lower Decks was renewed as well. You know, we know those two series are coming back and Discovery is coming to an end out of the current crop of things. They also announced that Section 31 movie as well is happening. Mm-hmm. There are lots of Star Trek stuff going on at the moment which I'm really, really enjoying. I think, didn't they announce a Star Trek cadets kind oh, of Oh, the Star Trek Academy? Yes. They Academy. talked about it during, like, during the last season of um, Discovery, the previous season of Discovery, sorry. There was some talk from the showrunners, but hasn't been anything sort of since then. So I definitely remember writing the story about it. Yeah, we haven't had any casting or anything, but I think they have officially ordered... Yeah, they did. Back in March, when they announced the Section 31 movie, they announced the Star Trek uh, Starfleet Academy series as well. And they confirmed that that is going to action, but we haven't heard any more about that 
so far. And of course, with everybody on strike at the moment, we're not likely to hear anything for a while. So, uh, but but that is also in production. So there are four series plus a final series of Discovery at the moment, or oh. four four projects, let's say, because Section Thirty One is actually a movie. Yeah, I can see. I can see it here. I can see it. Very sort of bright and upbeat statement dropped by Alex Kurtman and No Galando. Which, yeah, definitely hope to see it. I think it'd be quite good if it's well done. Yeah, I think it will be. A lot of people have been talking about the Academy series. We don't really know exactly when it's set. That, I think, will be an interesting one moving forward. I mean, I am sad that we sort of lost Star Trek Prodigy, which was the... Mm-hmm. other animated series that's sort of more aimed at kids rather than Lower Decks, which is a, uh, an adult animation. But, I mean, there is still possibility that that will pop up somewhere else. Okay, so the next thing we mentioned is Netflix original movie, They Cloned Tyrone. Yes. Came on 21st, I believe, and stars Jay Boyega, Jamie Foxx, and Toyota Paris. And I've seen it advertised as Black Dynamite meets us. So <laughs> it's pretty wacky, pretty wacky. Uh, it's very much in that black exploitation sort of style if you've seen those sort of films from the 70s. You get, so like from the trailer, it tells you pretty early what's happening. We find this young man who we're following, Fontaine, a criminal in this black majority area. You don't really get much details about it, as in where it is, what state it is, and things like that. And you follow him like for a day, and at the end, something happens. And then the next day, he wakes up as if the previous events didn't happen. And basically, it's uncovering that mystery. And along the way, he is helped by Jamie Foxx's character called Sick Charles, which is a pimp, and Taylor Paris's Yo-Yo, which is a retiring sex worker who's trying to get out of the town. And it's wild. It's wacky. For me, it definitely sort of slows down a bit in the middle. Once you know what's happening, it doesn't really keep that momentum going on. Right. It is play for jokes. There's a lot of comedy in it. I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it, which is a shame because I was very much looking forward to it since I saw the trailer. But I know I just I feel like the execution didn't really make it for me. Right. Because I feel like for something like this, you're literally only following these three. And so it doesn't feel like there's an overall sort of message about black majority neighborhoods and, and the poor, something like that. But you don't really see any sort of examples or I don't know, just results of that because you're literally only following these three people and their stories. Right. So I feel like it's hard to care because you're doing that and then you're doing the comedy. So I, it fell a bit by the wayside for me. So yeah, That's I don't think I would necessarily recommend it. Yeah, I've seen a few bits and pieces of promotion for it, but um, it's not one I've gone and looked at. But uh, it's an interesting sort of cast. I mean, John Boyega. Uh, oh, it's Jamie, an amazing cast. Jamie Foxx, uh, Tiana Paris. Kiefer Sutherland is in there as Nixon apparently, according to the uh, cast list I'm looking at as well. So Yeah, that's a weird one, but <laughs> I think it's definitely down to expectations. And I've seen lots of people who really love it. I really think it's like really funny and just works well. It didn't quite run for me. Yeah. So next on my thing is we have seen Secret Invasion. Yes, yes, it is finished. It's just finished. And so I think a lot of Marvel fans were hoping that it would serve as an effective reset to recent disappointments. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it did that. No, I don't think it did. I don't think I don't think it did. That. that thought was sort of compounded when we found out how much it cost. Yes, yes. It's some, I, and everyone, and everyone I've, I've told you that, you know, I literally had people sit there and stop believing me until I went and sent them a link. <laughs> There's no way that those six episodes cost that much money. Yeah, so what what was the overall cost? I believe it was two to one. 221 million US. Right. Which is a lot. Which is like a mid blockbuster. Yeah. And while there is certainly a decent amount of like special effects running through things, I've definitely watched enough 90s sci-fi to know that that should cost that much money. Yes. So obviously to get back to you, actually get into it, it's the story of Nick Fury returning to Earth. Because if you are a Marvel fan, you know he's been off in space on his space station. Yes. Doing things. At the beginning, it's very much it feels like, oh, this is a swan song for Nick. You can see like he's a beat too slow. You can see him, what looks like he's making mistakes. And we sort of learn more about his relationship with the Skrulls, which we haven't really caught up with in anything other than um, end credit scenes since Captain Marvel. And so we learned that there was a deal between Nick and the Skrulls, mm-hmm. which basically is come work for me, be my eyes and ears, which is pretty handy if you have shaped up aliens who can, you know, read minds. Yeah. That's a pretty useful thing for a spy to have. Yeah. And in return between him and Captain Marvel, they would find the Skrulls a, a new planet 
because obviously the whole point of Captain Marvel is that they are fleeing the Kree scroll war. Yeah. And we quickly find out he didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just, it's weird because if we're watching it, it looks like it just doesn't seem like he cares. Yeah. It, look, it, it feels like that it's like, what, 30 years, 30, 40 years since it started. And it honestly looks like he hasn't given it a second thought since then. That's how it comes across. Mm-hmm. And if it's not supposed to come across, that's a writing problem. And so you find it very hard to root for him when things start going horribly wrong. Yeah. Which which in this case is there is a scroll rebellion led by basically one of his top soldiers who decides that they're going to shake things up on earth and it's never really explained in great detail what the plan is because it could be because scrolls let's just say they're more hardy they could ratchet up tensions among humanity till they blew themselves up and only scrolls to be left yeah that that seemed to be what i got as being yeah. the plan yeah but it feels like half of this all that sort of shit shit but it's a weird one and i I feel like they've been talking about it for ages and you know the thing with Marvel build up you get to build up years and years before mm-hmm. and you're sort of expecting it was going to be good and it's okay definitely good episodes but it just didn't feel like he had much of a direction. It's got an amazing cast. Yeah. Because you got Samuel Jackson, you got Emily Clark, you got Don Cheadle, you have Kingsley Benadir, who plays Graphic, which is the antagonist. Yeah. We get right. um, Ben Mendelsohn playing Talos back. Yeah. We have Olivia Coleman as a terrifying British she spy master. Is Sonia Falsworth, which is, is Olivia's character, is absolutely outstanding and I could watch an entire season of her because yeah. she is as you say unbelievably terrifying in the fact that she's so blasé about kind of everything and, and yeah. it's just wonderful and she is just like it's that she's that disturbing she is like what you hope that spy people aren't mm-hmm. because you just couldn't deal with having those sorts of people just running around with no oversight yeah. Oh, I just, I don't know what to say. I, I think, watched it and it's yeah. just like, is this, is this it? Is this the whole thing? Is this all, is this all we're doing? Yeah. And I think that is part of the problem because the secret invasion in the comic books was such a huge event. And they, I mean, yeah. it's an event that they've done a couple of times, actually, I think. Yeah, the, um, what, yeah. And I think that is part of the problem is the fact that. Secret Invasion as an event kind of should have been the end of a phase as a movie Mm. and had lots of the larger stars in. Now, you don't expect that to happen with the bigger stars in a TV series. You know, it's not surprising that you've not got, you know, Robert Downey showing up or anything like that in this. But equally, it just feels a bit of a waste of that storyline when yeah yeah unfortunately this follows in the thing that tv and film is notorious for when it comes to comic books which is stealing names not and not using them correctly yeah because i know if you call something jesus of nazareth you think oh it's probably going to be about jesus when it comes to comics they call it anything and because it's relatively easy to just go and google the name and get a nice overview from something like wikipedia on what happens and then when you head to the cinema or you turn on your disney plus and see something that's nothing like it Mm -hmm. the whole thing of secret invasion in the comics is that nothing you see could be trusted but this is a spy show so no one else is seeing this there's like three or four people who we are following who know about the scrolls we only see like the third hand effects of that through like the terrorist attacks that we see happening or we we don't even see we hear about we hear about happening across the world and because it isn't superheroes who you know it isn't like spider-man suddenly not being that guy you know from the Bronx, but instead some alien who's been looking like him for months it just doesn't have the same effect yeah they try to combine two things which don't really work as a connection yeah that's the thing in the comic books it's a huge story it's key members of the avengers which have Mm. been taken over by scrolls and yeah. you've got, like, say, people like Tony Stark, who is actually a scroll, and they use it as a big reset in the comic book to be able to sort of bring versions of those characters back because they've been sort of held for years somewhere else. Whereas in the TV show, there's only really one character that's majorly affected 
by this who is a name that you kind of know and with the rest of them it's faceless politicians that have been replaced that we're meeting for the first time in the majority that is the case so it just feels a lot weaker than it should really have been because you could have taken that story and created this sort of big thing and this big reset and that's not what happened here you also lost some sort of key characters spoilers for the end of it but amelia clark's character gaia oh boy Uh, you know they end up with her getting an awful lot of power and you do kind of think okay well what are you going to do with that character moving forward because you've just created somebody who could essentially probably destroy the entire event i mean you know you know you've created this really 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 powerful character and are we going to see her again what what's going to happen with her so that i find weird the only redeeming thing from this is the armor wars series is going to be quite interesting with Rody, mm. because again spoilers for secret invasion we know that Rody for a period of time has been a scroll and mm. at what point did he actually turn yeah. because some people and i think it, yeah and i think it, it can be inferred by the events that like he is probably one of the longest down yeah that he was probably one of the first that they took over his life we don't know when there's some teases by the director but we still don't really know because he doesn't confirm it he just sort of teases around it so yeah. we'll just give him the benefit now but it does seem like he has been a scroll for probably the longest amount of time yeah i mean there are a number of people saying oh he was taken after civil war and i don't think that's probably the case i think it was probably more likely he was taken after the events of endgame because if you took him after civil war it means that he wasn't around when tony died and the Mm. character that we saw Mm. at that point was a scroll and the way that his character was acting didn't really change until after the events of Endgame because it also means he missed a blip as well so I will find that out I'm sure at some point but it, I mean it does have this thing that moving into Armor Wars which is Armor Wars is about the fact that the Iron Man suits have got into the hands of somebody else and Rhodey's trying to get Russell control of them again so that sort of sets up that story quite nicely because of the fact that Rhodey has been disappeared essentially um, somebody else has be running around looking like him so it, it sets that up for an interesting series but that's sort of what it feels like is is th- this entire series is just to set that up because this, the rest of the stuff is sort of a bit all over the place and mm. you know I mean, there are some positives in there. Like you say, Olivia Coleman as Sonia yeah. Walsworth is, is absolutely outstanding. Yeah, if you're and, Olivia Coleman, yeah, definitely, definitely cue this one up next because she just she's yeah. in there just chewing on the scenery. It's, it's great. Yeah, she's she's brilliant. It's tremendous this. stuff. And I mean, it sets up the the next Marvels movie as well a little bit. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, Fury does. The thing is, we stuff. hope that thing's been rewritten so tight. Who knows? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, but we do know Fury's in it because we've seen him in yeah. the trailer. So yeah, uh, you know. It, it does set up a certain amount of that. So I, I don't know. I mean, I enjoyed it enough, but it's it's very much a sort of three-star C-level series for me because not that it was bad and it had some good moments, but it threw up a lot of oddities and it's a wasted opportunity. I think that would be my feeling on it. So I, I think you can watch it and enjoy it. It's just, if you know the comic books, you're going to be going, well, why wasn't this used in a different way? Mm. Definitely. So the next thing that I've been watching is Almost Paradise Season 2. Yes. Which has come to freebie here in the UK. It stars Christian Kane from all the things, musician and actor. Mm -hmm. Christian Kane, obviously you know from The Librarians and Leverage. He plays a similar character here, (laughs) whose name is Alex Walker, and he's a former DEA agent. He's forced into sort of medical retirement, because as we see sort of in the first sort of episode of season one, he's betrayed by his partner and injured, and that sort of led to a sort of heart stress condition, which meant that obviously he could no longer do his job. And so to recover, he heads to this island in the Philippines that he remembers from his very first mission as a DA agent, basically somewhere that he felt calm and peaceful. So when he gets there, he finds things are very different. And there's a massive hotel in what used to just be like this nice beach. 
he sort of settles in because he's bought a gift shop with his pension of retirement. As we sort of, he gets involved with a police investigation on this island and he ends up helping them and boom there's our thing we have our american in the philippines helping out every now and then with the local police over all sorts of interesting crimes <laughs> and he helps ernesto alamaris and kai mendoza and that's played by arthur cunha which is a very well-known philippine actors he's been in born identity a legacy and a few other sort of international films as well as lots of philippine films because it's a very big filipino film industry and samantha Michelle, who plays Kai Mendoza. And yeah, it's fun. It's very much a throwback to sort of Magnum P.I. and yeah. all those sorts of 80s style case of week things, which is a good and bad thing. Because Alex is sort of, did you ever watch Y5-0? Yes. Obviously, obviously the new one. He's very much like a Danny. Right, okay. You know, he's very much fish out water. Mm -hmm. And I think with those sorts of characters, they walk the line of lovable jerk and potentially a little bit racist right because there's a lot of things because obviously you can see clear i think what why that because it's very much a comedy action thing they like to make him the butt of all the jokes mm -hmm. they usually just come from him like not knowing about any aspect of filipino culture as, a, as this ongoing joke that he for some reason he can't figure out the exchange rate right which is a little weird when very much a case of he wants to live here for the rest of his life mm -hmm. and so it sort of goes back and forth of is he just a bit of an idiot or is it ugh? i guess a bit uncomfortable in some cases right. it's, clear he's, it's clear that you can see he's a nice guy and they're at pain to see that because like half the adventures are he meets someone who's helping him with the thing while it's someone who's training him because he's looking to get back into the dating scene so he wants to you know look his best and that person's killed and he's very much you'll stop at nothing to find out who was responsible for that mm -hmm. but then you see the other side of it and you think eh, those two parts don't mesh up mm -hmm. if you get what I'm saying yeah. that someone would be so nice to do that but not nice enough to figure out the exchange rate <laughs> or it's a weird thing so that doesn't always work if you right. can look past that it's fun and Christian Kane is great um, I'm really a fan of Arthur Kuna because he's just sort of the scene detective but I mean, he's very much just this quiet guy with his very wry observations and you know he'll drop a joke in or two and he steals most scenes <laughs> just because his character feels a lot more like a real human being Yeah. in a way that you look at Christian Kane and go no that's not a real person you could not meet a person like that in, in real life because they, they can't be that good and that bad all at the same time right yeah and also you get your typical sometimes angry sometimes helpful police captain and <laughs> i think i've watched four episodes um they're pretty good i think one thing i would highlight is that it shows it's pretty much all filipino cast you get occasional international guest stars like someone popped up who you might recognize from the arc right and the outpost yeah if you know those two well you know who i'm talking about so that's i just like a, it's a filipino crew as well so there's that which i think is pretty good but i'm not sure i'm sure i'll watch the end of the end of season i'll still be thinking about alex as a character by itself yeah it's an interesting one i haven't actually been and looked at it yet but it's dean devlin which is yeah. uh, the person behind librarians and leverage which is why christian kane is the lead in this and you're having people from the arc show up because uh, that's also his show as well it's an interesting sort of setup i i think somebody uh, sort of said it's got a little bit of sort of burn notice going on in there as well and uh, mm. you know the sort of hawaii 5 -0 stuff it's it's in that Kind yeah. of vague. Less less in the second season, very much in the first season. I think the burn notice thing is the single identity stuff. He's just constantly undercover. Whereas in, the, in this season, I don't think he's read on it once. Right. He literally is just is himself in a situation. It's less that. But I think there's lots of good there. It's just that little thing of that throwing that out of the water thing, which I I know you could you could do better with that. Yeah, yeah. That is one that I I keep on meaning to go and pick up. I kind of forget about free even though it is free and it's on Amazon and you should be able to kind of go and get it but uh, almost paradise on freebie that is uh, yes this is one that I should go and look up at some point yeah. alright so the last thing I'm talking about you just heard enough of me speaking endlessly about TV is The Night Agent yes everybody and their mother raved about this I didn't watch it when it came out so I had some time and I thought okay let's watch this let's see if it's as good as everyone says if I can believe the hype and honestly, it is. Yeah. It should be that good. It's just solid, fun writing from beginning to end. Great leads. This Gabriel Basel guy is going places. Yes. Along with Lucian Buchanan, who plays Rose Larkin. Right? He's decided to protect. And it's just a really great show. Always entertained. There's never any boring parts. 
Um, there's an interesting thing. Um, Fala Evans Akebola popped up, who you may not remember, but she's in this show, Siren, oh, which yeah. I loved. She was one of the leads in that, but she plays a Secret Service agent. It's just really good. Also, Eve Harlow, who I remember from like the 100, and pops up in a lot of things. She's also in NCIS LA as a recurring villain. Right. It's a really great show, and you should watch it. And we will say what it's about. So it's low-level FBI agent Peter Sutherland works in the basement of the White House, manning a phone that never really until the night it does, propelling him into a conspiracy that leads all the way to the Oval Office. And to note that Peter Southern has a father who was disgraced, who was an FBI agent, basically got caught spying on the other side. And he also happens to have, like, before the events of the story, basically saved a subway train from a terrorist attack. Basically gets people off the train. And so this is that weird thing where it's clear in the first episode that he isn't trusted because of what his father did. Mm -hmm. And it's very much a chip on the shoulders and that definitely affects him. Because that event happened when he was still a teenager. Yeah. So it's very much, very, very traumatic sort of thing for him. But yeah, it's it's a great show. Um, lots of stars. D.B. Woodside pops up in it. Yeah. Carrie Machette as a president pops up. I really enjoyed this. I uh, watched it a while back. It's from Sean Ryan, who uh, you'll know from being the creator of things like The Shield and Lie to mm. Me and SWAT and Timeless and, uh, yeah, you know, really good show creator. He, again, knocked it out of the park with this. I think it's a really solid series it's a good little conspiracy thing it's really fun it's got a lot of action a lot of drama it's funny in places a really nice balance of stuff uh, but yeah really really good show uh night agent on netflix and i would definitely highly recommend that one it's it's well worth looking at yeah that's all for me for me carrying on with foundation season two which uh plot wise i'm not going to get into because we'd be here all day but i think the storyline took me sort of an episode to get back into it with three episodes in now I think part of that is because the storyline is so complex in the first season of that. Jumping back into the second season, I watched a little bit of a recap and then was like, okay, I'm trying to sort of find where we are. And we now sort of started on what is the the sort of proper season two plot. And I like the direction it's going in. It seems to have sort of, you know, it's always been fairly complex, but it's holding together really well. Uh, so I'm really enjoying the second season of that. Also at Apple, though, I watched Hijack, mm-hmm. which is the new Idris Elba fronted drama. It is from George K and Jim Field Smith, who are the people behind the criminal series on Netflix and George also works on Lupin and he worked on the first season of Killing Eve. Jim Phil Smith worked on Litvin Yenko was another one of his as well. Uh, he worked on The Wrong Mans and a whole bunch of other things but they, they've worked together on a number of different things and a um, pair of them have created this series. Uh, as the title rather suggests, it's about a hijack of a plane. It stars Idris Elba as Sam who is a talent business negotiator who finds himself having to use his skills to broker a piece to end a hijacking of a seven-hour flight from Dubai to London. So that is the, the main setup of it. It's a really nice, interesting, tense thriller, and it's told in real time as well. So if for those of you that are fans of 24 and are looking for something similar, this is this is basically that sort of thing. It's not quite as action-led as that. It's more the sort of thriller side of things. But uh, yeah, you've got Idris Elba in there as Sam, who is the lead. Neil Maskell, who you'll know from Peaky Blinders. He showed up in Lipping Yanko. He was also in as well. He's been in a whole bunch of different things. He plays one of the lead hijackers max beasley is in there as a police officer eve miles in there from torchwood she plays an air traffic controller archie Punjabi, who is another police officer as well mm. neil stuck is in there as the home secretary so there's a pretty solid 
cast throughout as well. It's interesting because they've not gone down the route of the plane being hijacked by a bunch of random people from Middle Eastern country, which, you know, would have been kind of boring. It's much more interesting than that. It's fairly obvious. I was really spoiling anything because it's obvious from from the get go that the people that hijacking plane are British and it's a British plane. So it then becomes also about not only the hijack itself, but also why are they hijacking this plane that is flying from Dubai to London? And what are their plans and what are they trying to do with it? You know, what are their plans to do with it? We're six episodes in at the moment. There is a seventh episode coming this week. I'm not sure how many there is in the series in total. I don't know whether it's an eight, whether it's seven, eight or ten. I'm guessing if it's a seven hour flight, it's probably seven episodes actually. So maybe it's the finale next week because as I say, it is told in real time. That is definitely one that I would highly recommend going to check out. It's on Apple TV at the moment. As I say, I think the finale is this week. So uh, yeah, worth going to look that one up, but that's Hijack. Good Omens has returned on Prime Video as well for the second Mm. season. This is an interesting one because the first season of Good Omens very much followed the book. I mean, they adapted it, but it was based very much on the Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett book. The second season kind of goes beyond the book. And I believe Gaiman did have some notes because him and Pratchett had talked about writing a sequel to it, but hadn't actually done it before uh, Terry passed. So there was some sort of stuff to work from, but he needed a co-writer for the second season. So brought in John Finnamore. Now, if you don't know John Finnamore, he has a Radio 4 show, which is utterly hilarious and very, very weird. He's also appeared on the Now show on Radio 4 a number of times. He's very much a Radio 4 kind of person. I think he pops up in Avenue 5 as well. Uh, but John Finnamore's Sylvania program, which is the Radio 4 series, is hilarious and very weird. And there are points in this second season, like the very opening of the, the first episode, is a very, very John Finnamore intro. You can feel his fingerprints all all over it. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't John that wrote the opening of that first episode. We are back though with Crowley and Aziraphale, who are David Tennant and Michael Sheen. The second season has the pair of them who are basically hiding out on Earth, just living their lives. They're, they're both being rejected by heaven and hell pretty much, but have struck this sort of uneasy deal where the pair of them just get to hang out on Earth. And then Gabriel goes missing, which is the Archangel Gabriel played by John Hamm, goes missing from heaven and turns up on Aziraphale's doorstep. And it's sort of where you go from there and why he's missing. And he also doesn't have any of his memories, so doesn't know he's the Archangel Gabriel. It's really fun. It's really funny. I've only done a couple of episodes so far and I'm very much enjoying the sort of couple of episodes I've seen. Michael Sheen, David Tennant, John Hamm in the lead roles. Some of the season one cast are back in season two, but playing different characters. That's kind of interesting. Peter Davison shows up in this. They go a lot more back into sort of different points of history in this second season. And Peter Davidson shows up playing Job from the Bible in the second season. So uh, that, that, that was kind of fun to see him there. There's a number of other people that pop up as well. Have you jumped into any of this yet? I have not seen the Normans. to see the occasional clip pops up on TikTok or whatever. Yeah, they are joyous together watching those two. So I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy that. The entire second season is up. They dumped it up as a box set. So uh, you can go and check that out. That's Good Omens Season 2, which is on Prime Video right now. Working my way through the current season of Outlander, which I'm kind of enjoying, and The Witcher Season 3, which I'm one episode to the end. Have you watched any of the third season i haven't seen any of the witcher oh haven't you okay third season of the witcher is an interesting one it's not been great i think it's fair to say i've got the final episode to go i very much struggled connecting with it and getting kind of back into it it just doesn't feel like it, it's working particularly well and i don't know whether that's because henry cavill's heart wasn't in it which i mean we know because he's left the show i don't know whether it, it's just the writing's not 
particularly good. I, I'm struggling to put my finger on exactly what it is that isn't working. Pacing seems a bit all over the place. It just doesn't seem to work particularly well this third season, which is a shame because I enjoyed the first couple of seasons. And as we mentioned last week, you know, you've got Liam Hensworth coming into the lead role for season four. And if it gets canned after the fourth season, Liam is the one that's probably going to get blamed for it. And I, I yeah, that's a shame. That does happen. It is not going to be Liam's fault because the signs are there that this is going downhill already. So I'm hoping the fourth season pushes some life back into it. And it really works because I think the characters are interesting and I love the world. Certainly the production value is perfectly reasonable. I just needs to be better than it is. I hope it gets renewed beyond a fourth season and I hope the full season kind of works and it comes back okay. But yeah, if it does go, it is not going to be Liam's fault. Uh, so, so yes, as I say, I haven't quite reached the end of this season yet. And, and that should sort of be a sign because the other seasons I kind of binged my way through in this one, I've been dropping in and out of and going back to when I've got time to watch an episode. So yeah, but yeah, season three is out now on Netflix. So that's all the stuff we've been watching. Let's move on to some TV and film news. So we start off the TV and film news with the renewals, cancellations and pickups. A uh, couple of cancellations we've got up here, which is a musical comedy that's been cancelled by Hulu after one season. That has been airing on Disney Plus in the UK. Previous shows that we mentioned, one of the previous shows, Grease Rise of the Pink Ladies, which is still cancelled after one season, but um, it apparently is getting a VOD and DVD release after the Paramount has completely removed it because they did, you know, a complete eradication of it. So like with Star Trek Prodigy, it got completely taken off the service. But in November, if you are a Grease fan and you want to see that series and you missed it when it was on Paramount, it is getting a DVD and VOD release. So you will be able to find it somewhere. Uh, you'll have to pay for it, obviously, but you will be able to find it if you want it. And Dating With My Mates, which was a show which aired on W Channel last summer, that is apparently not returning for a new season. Over on the renewal side of things, Righteous Gemstones has been renewed for a full season by HBO, so that will be coming back. Apparently, Danny McBride's most successful HBO show out of all of his HBO shows. Oh, yeah, I saw that. So I saw that report. I haven't actually watched any of it, but uh, I've just been doing really well. as on Sky Comedy over here, that one. Good news for, or possibly bad news for parents, depending on which way you look at it. Paw Patrol has been renewed for an 11th season, and its spin-off Rubble and Crew has been renewed for a second season by Nickelodeon, so there'll be more Paw Patrol. At least you won't have to listen to the same episodes on repeat then. Ramesh Ranganathan's Misadventures series and Missing Investigation series are returning to BBC Two. They've ordered more of that. The book review series Between the Covers with Sarah Cox, that's been renewed for a seventh series on BBC Two as well. Waterloo Road will be returning for a new series on BBC One in 2024, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody. Mm -hmm. The BBC have reportedly commissioned a second series of A Very British Scandal, or a, a third series, if you count the very English scandal, I guess. But um, they've commissioned another series of that, which will be a, a different scandal. It won't be the same one, obviously. So there's possibly another one of those coming. The Joel Domet game show In With a Shout has been renewed for a second season a series by ITV. Uh, Family Fortunes also been renewed by ITV. It was last filmed in 2021, so it's been a while since they've filmed episodes of that, but that will be coming back. And uh, Gangs of London, it looks like he's going to be shooting a third season in September, uh, according to some production listings that are out there. So uh, it looks like that will be coming back as well. In terms of pickups and other news, Star Trek Lower Decks, as we were talking about earlier, season four will premiere on Thursday, the 7th of September on Paramount Plus in the UK and in the US. We technically will get it a few hours before the US does. That's Star Trek Lower Decks season four on Thursday, the 7th of September. Seasons one to three, if you missed those on Prime Video, they're getting added to Paramount Plus as well on the 30th of August. So you'll be able to catch up the first three seasons and then watch season four when that comes out. It is a really, really good show that uh it's very funny but it is very 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 star trek as well and it is really worth watching you've not watched that one yet have you i have not no it is from one of the guys behind rick and morty but it's reined in a little bit from the more extreme rick and morty stuff but it also has very very much kept its heart 
of its sort of next generation Star Trek feel to it. So I would highly recommend that. It's very funny and it's a must watch for Star Trek fans, that one. The BBC has picked up a couple of shows, uh, all five seasons of The Bold Type, which is an American dramedy, which gives us a glimpse into the outrageous lives of Jane Cat and Sutton, three millennials who work in New York at the nation's top women's magazine, Scarlet. That did previously air, I think, on Prime and then on Netflix for seasons one to four. But the fifth season has never premiered in the UK. So that will be a UK premiere. We don't know exactly when that's dropping, but they have picked up all five seasons of The Bold Type. So that is coming. And the other thing they picked up is Bad Behaviour, which is a four episode Australian mini series which stars Jay McKinnon, who stars as 25 year old Joe McKenzie, who bumps into an old high school friend, Alice Kang. Memories come flooding back of a brutal year they spent together at Silver Creek, the wilderness camp of an exclusive girls' boarding school. That's the setup for that. It's a four episode mini series. It's called Bad Behaviour. Don't know when that's going to be landing either, but uh, both of those have been picked up by the BBC. They're going to be airing on BBC Three and on iPlayer for those. And ITV has announced a new drama called Breathtaking, which is coming in the autumn. It's a thought-provoking and poignant account of an NHS doctor in the eye of the storm during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's Golden Globe award-winning actress Joanne Froggart in the lead role. It's written by Rachel Clark with Jeb Mercurio and uh, Pranasa Pranajar, I think his name is. Breathtaking is based on Rachel Clark's personal memoir because as well as being a screenwriter and writer, she's also a doctor. It's adapted for television by her alongside Jeb Mercurio, who is of course the person that is behind Line of Duty and Bodyguard, who you may not have realised given that he is a hugely successful writer and producer at this point, but he's also a former doctor as well. So that's two former doctors. And then uh, Pranasa as well is an actor, a writer, a director and a former doctor. So uh, you may know him if he was in The Crown and he was on 10% as well. So you've got three former doctors writing a thing about the uh, the NHS during the pandemic. It's called Breathtaking, which is an interesting title for it. But uh, yeah, do you work around the NHS? Any interest in this? No, obviously, because I because I do work around it. And yes. the last thing you really want to be reminded of is that. <laughs> yeah, that was a horrible time and I definitely don't want, don't to want anything it. that, no, yes. that would be, yeah. I, I could sort of understand, I, I did, I, somebody did post, when I posted this, or somebody did write a thing saying, isn't it a little bit early to start doing these sort of things? And possibly, yes, I would possibly agree. But I mean, I don't know. It's coming anyway. It's coming in the autumn. They've said it's called Breathtaking. It's going to be on ITV. Uh-huh. Just wanted to give a little update on the strike action. Obviously, there's, there's no moving forward right now on anything basically the california governor gavin newsom has basically said if the strike's still going on in september he has offered up his services as sort of a negotiator to try and negotiate between the various parties so the the writers the actors and the hollywood studios because at the moment the problem is that there really isn't any sort of middleman that both sides trust and gavin newsom is, is a fairly well respected politician that could potentially broker a peace between between the pair of them. Other than that, though, there's no real movement. As we know, the writers have been on strike for a number of months. They were joined by the actors last month. They are striking for an increase to their minimum wage, improvements to their pensions and health insurance, improved working conditions. The main point being, though, an increase to streaming residuals and the issue of AI and the use of their likenesses by studios as well. The streaming residuals issue is one of the main key sticking points basically because of the way streaming residuals are the residuals being the money that is paid to performance when a show airs the main issue with that being the way streaming residuals are currently calculated is a flat fee which is based on the amount of money that the actor is initially paid for the role along with the number of subscribers that are on that service it is not tied to how popular the show is so 
if you go back up to something like the night agent that we mentioned earlier and the lead actor in that being um, Gabriel Basso, who is not a particularly well-known name, the chances are he didn't get paid as much for taking the lead in that show. So despite the fact that that was one of the most popular shows on Netflix, the amount of residuals that he will be getting will be very, very, very low for that. We've seen a number of stories of people People that have worked on hit shows that are getting no residuals at all. It's a really wonky way of paying people that work on these sort of hit shows and it needs addressing. The problem is that the way that they address that is by attaching it to how popular a particular show is and with subscription streaming due to the various revenue models, the value of a show to say Disney Plus is completely different to the value of a show to say Netflix. So there isn't one standardised way that they can necessarily necessarily calculate the value of a show to that particular streaming service. And the other issue that you have is that these streaming services don't want to tell you how many subscribers they have or how popular shows are. They're all self-reporting that stuff and they're not prepared to open up their algorithms or open up their secret box of toys to explain that to people. This is the impasse that we're at right now. So streaming residuals are one thing. The other thing is the issue of of AI and digital actors, like we were hearing reports that a number of studios had approached background actors and were asking for them to come in for basically one day. They were fully scanning the background actors and paying them for that one day. They've then said, right, we now own your likeness and we can use it in perpetuity across and whatever we like. The studios have refuted that saying, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. We are taking people in, we are scanning them, but we can only use them for that particular project. As though that's better. Cause- exactly. Because obviously they would get paid by the current rules, which would be a day rate. But obviously it could be the equivalent of like six or seven days that they would be generated, which yeah. obviously they get nothing for that. Exactly. Exactly. So they are still only paying them for one day, whereas they could be in the background across the movie and they would have had like seven, eight, ten. 12 days on set and so they're losing out on 11 days of pay it's still problematic and you've got to bear in mind that the SAGRAF reunion 95% of the people in that union are background people they are not the headline actors that you know they're not even Mm. the sort of recurring roles that you know they are people that you see in the background of shots so that's what they're fighting for we're seeing this interesting point as well where there are a number of independent shows and films that have got waivers from sag Afra to actually shoot. So uh, When Calls the Heart has got a waiver. Turan, the Apple series, has got a waiver. Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction, which is the Jonathan Frakes fronted series, that's got a waiver as well. The reason that those shows and those movies, and there are a lot more than that, but there, those shows and those movies have got waivers is because they have agreed directly with sag Afra for everything that sag Afra have asked for. So these independent production companies are doing deals that the Hollywood studios are not prepared to do and Mm. are agreeing to protections that the Hollywood studios are not prepared to do. It is worth mentioning though, for instance, in the case of When Calls the Heart, that literally represents three actors in an ensemble piece of maybe 40 or 50 actors. Yeah. Because When Calls the Heart was already filming and so the plan was they would just shoot around those three actors who are three of the stars, but they would shoot around them Mm -hmm. because obviously Canada has its own actor unions and they're not currently on strike. Yeah, it's a similar issue with Turan as well in that a lot of that, I suspect a lot of the actors in that show because it's set in Turan, there will be some sag Afra actors in that, but by no means all of them. So it's a similar issue with some of those other shows. Some of the movies that sort of more applies to the movies where they've kind of done larger Mm -hmm. deals. Yeah, What they're trying to do is because the rules basically state that if you're a union a member you cannot work on a show or even promote a show which is for a struck company but on the flip side of that you've got shows like House of the Dragon which are still filming because of the fact that that mainly has a British cast and mainly films with casts that are members of Equity rather than SAG Equity being the British Actors Union so there are still things filming in the UK but there are also stuff that has been stopped from filming in the UK because it's mainly 
only done with SAG actors rather than equity actors. So it, it's a little bit mixed and a little bit all over the place. But basically, yeah, if, if they are mainly British casts, then they are being allowed to carry on filming, even if it's being done under the production arm of an American company. It's going to keep rolling on for a while. We've no idea how this is ever going to get resolved because they are way, way far apart, those, at the moment. As I said last week, we're not seeing a huge amount of effect of it at the moment. It's really going to start to bite when we get into the autumn seasons and those big network shows don't return. We'll wait and see, but that's just a little update on the strike. Mm -hmm. Over back onto things which have already been shot, the BBC has revealed the cast for their Famous Five adaptation that they're doing, which is, of course, based on the Enid Blyton stories, follows five daring young explorers as they encounter treacherous, action-packed adventures, remarkable mysteries, unparalleled danger, and their stand secrets and unforgettable odyssey that involves the power of camaraderie between fearless young heroes. Adaptation of the Enid Blyton stories. It was interesting when I posted this on Facebook because it possibly produced one of the most toxic comment threads oh no. I, I've ever had oh. uh, when, I, when I posted it, mainly because they've cast a black actor as George on the show, who is the tomboy girl on the series. And so what would be my answer to that, really? Really, I entirely get the purpose of changing one of the characters to a black actor, particularly in this day and age. Judging by the photo that they posted, it looks relatively authentic, apart from the fact the skin colour of one of the characters. I have absolutely zero issue with that. Get a life, you losers yeah. <laughs> that are going on about this on Tell Facebook. Them. And Tell them, Dave. Tell them. I just really find something more entertaining to do with your lives because this is uh, it's ridiculous. Diana Babnikova is the person playing George. Elliot Rose is playing Julian. Kit Raxon is playing Dick. Flora Jacobi Richardson is playing Anne. And the fifth member of the Famous Five is, of course, the dog, played by Timmy the Dog and his bearded colleague Cross. They have announced some other people that are joining it. Uh, Jack Gleason, who I, I don't think I've seen in anything since Game of Thrones, actually, who played Joffrey in that yeah. show, who was outstanding. Honestly, I thought in that he retired. Role. I think he did. I think he went and sort of got on education and decided he was going to do that for a bit. He sort of stepped away for a bit. But he has come back to acting. He's going to be playing a character called Wentworth and Kinjarin, who was in Moonlight and I May Destroy You, is playing Fanny and James Lance from Ted Lasso. He's playing Quinton and Diana Quick from Father Brown and Houdini and Doyle is playing Mrs. Wentworth. Directed by Tim Kirby, who directed Fleabag, Asim Abassi, who directed Count Abdullah and Cake is directing the second episode and Bill Eagles who directed Beautiful Creatures, Gotham and Pennyworth is directing the third episode. Matthew Reed is one of the main writers behind it. It looks like it's going to be quite a fun adaptation. It is very much being aimed at a sort of kids family audience. Enid Blyton stories possibly passed you by, I'm guessing. Uh, well, I used to read them. I used, oh, to, I used to yeah, I inherited a lot of books. We used to get those ones as well as the Secret 7. I think so. I used to have to read through those books. Yeah. Seems fine to me. You say like obviously it's aimed at family thing. I wonder when they're going to schedule it. It feels like it's probably is, a, it, is it an evening show? When it was, is it like a Sunday early evening sort of thing? It feels like a Sunday Sunday early evening show to me. Maybe the sort of Doctor Who slot, maybe slightly earlier. Mm -hmm. But it feels like that Sunday sort of tea time early evening slot seems quite likely. I mean, we'll see. They may put it out over Christmas as well. I mean, that may be the other option because it is only like four, three, four, three episodes, much like the Wuzzle Gummage thing that they did. That is the, the Famous Five series, which is coming soon. Well, soonish. The other interesting bit of news was to do with the Lando series, which is in development for Disney Plus, of course, based on the Star Wars character. It was originally had Justin Simeon, who was the creator of Dear White People. He was originally attached as writer, but it appears that he's now left the project. And uh, interesting, Stephen and Donald Glover have taken over the writing duties. Now, Donald Glover obviously played Lando in the solo movie. He hasn't officially actually said that he's going to be playing the character on screen again. They've not actually officially announced that he is the version of Lando that he's going to be in the series, because it could have been a series about him. All we knew when they announced it was there were going to be a Lando series. We didn't know 
whether it was going to use old Lando in Billy Dee Williams or whether it was going to be a young Lando series in Donald Glover. It's still not being confirmed that it is going to be Donald Glover or it could be both of them. I mean, it could be something which is one of those things where they use an old Lando and then it goes back into a sort of young Lando and then I mean maybe they do something like that so we absolutely don't know at the moment but it looks like Donald Glover is going to be writing it along with his brother Stephen Donald obviously you know from Atlanta having created that he's also been working on the Mr and Mrs Smith TV oh, yeah. series which he's doing as well and various other things uh, you know I mean he's always been fairly busy his brother Stephen is a writer and exec producer in his own right. Also worked on Atlanta and Pen the Films, Guava Island and House Party as well. I mean, obviously knows the character really well. I mean, we don't know any more about it than that. Um, I have to say, I mean, the, you know, that, that whole solo film got slated quite a lot and there were issues with it, yes. But the one issue there wasn't was with the casting. Elden Ehrenreich was absolutely superb as a young Han Solo. I don't care what anybody else says. And Donald Glover was brilliant as Lando. So uh, I, I thought the casting was wonderful for that. I kind of would like to see a Lando series. I think it, it could work really well. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, it's been so long since I've sort of actually taken a proper look at the Star Wars current thing. I don't know. I did not see I'm Solo myself. I would say take a step back, ignore all the critics. Go and mm-hmm. watch that film for what it is. It is basically a heist movie. Mm-hmm. It is worth going to watch. It is a fun little mm. film. And I really rather enjoyed it. And I think the casting was great. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think it's a decent enough movie. I think the problem was that there was all sorts of issues with director changes and all that sort of thing. And it upset people and they went for it. And unnecessarily, I think. But Al Reich is great as a young Han Solo. He's really channeling a young Harrison Ford there. Donald Glover is great as a young Lando as well. So it looks like those two, uh, Stephen and Donald Glover, will be writing the Lando series. I mean, we don't know whether it's going to star him or whether it's going to be young Lando, old Lando or both. We don't know. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is coming. So that's all the news we've got for this week. Just some highlights for next week on TV. <laughs> Highlights for next week. Kevin Can F Himself Season 2 finally gets a UK premiere date. Unfortunately, it's on AMC, which nobody has. Uh, so <laughs> 2nd of August, 9pm, that is landing on there. Uh, I mean, I, hopefully it shows up somewhere else where people can actually watch it. But at least AMC are actually airing it. But uh, yes. Departure Season 3, which we were talking about last time you were on, actually. Yep, yeah, big fan of it, so I'll definitely be looking forward to that. Yes, Departure Season 3. Sky Witness, 2nd of August at 9pm. Very much looking forward to that. First two seasons are actually going out on Sky at the moment and you can find them on demand. Really, really good conspiracy thriller about a accident investigation team. Really solid. Archie Punjabi leads that, but very, very good show. Departure season three, 2nd of August for that. Heartstopper returns for its second season. That's the huge hit Netflix show. That's on uh, 3rd of August. That lands on Netflix. And the wonderfully, brilliantly fun Only Murders in the Building returns for its third season. That's on Disney Plus on the 8th of August. That will be back. So Steve Martin, Martin Short, Selena Gomez return to uh, solve more crimes in that one. And that's all we have for this week. If people want to find more of your stuff, where can they find you? They can head over to HollywoodNorthNews.com. Net. Um, I'd also appreciate it. They headed over and um, search for Hollywood News and Off Net over on Facebook and to give a like a follow. Yes. Where Definitely. you can see a random sort of assortment of all the stories that we've been doing over the past couple of years. Yes. So go and check him out on, on Facebook and go and check him out on Twitter or X or whatever it's else it's, it is called these days as well. Yeah. X or YouTube or Instagram. Everywhere else. But HollywoodNorthNews.net for all that. For other people involved in the show, you can, of course, find Bex on twitch.tv forward slash Tristabyte, B-Y-T-E-S, who's streaming every week. Uh, I believe she's off on another the project at the moment so I don't know how much she's streaming right now but she's working on on something I think but you can generally find her all over social media as Trista Bytes that's B-Y-T-E-S and you'll always find lots of fun stuff with her Matt from entertainmenttalk.org you can find that over there for lots and lots more podcasts and uh, eTalk UK on social media for him 
And for us, you can go to the website at geektown.co.uk throughout the week and see the latest air date information. If you want to get in touch with your questions or comments, email us on podcast at geektown.co.uk. Leave a message on the website place. Find us at Geektown on Twitter or X, whatever. Uh, Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Geektown on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Geektown on Instagram at Geektown UK on TikTok at Geektown UK. And we're also on threads at Geektown UK as well. So go and find us all over social media. We shall see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.